I'd like to thank Albert Lee Seed for allowing me to participate today. And I'd especially like to thank Margaret Smith, who's the forage agronomist with Albert Lee Seed, for um, prompting me to think about some issues in organic systems that are a little bit different from what you see in conventionally managed systems with regard to weeds. So I'll be talking about how we can better use ecological processes and biological phenomena to improve weed management. So <clears throat> organic weed management is um, characterized by a number of constraints. First of all, cultivation alone is seldom fully effective and is often complicated by weather conditions. We heard a little bit before during the discussion of uh, crop rotations that there's some concern about intensive cultivation doing some damage to soil and uh, you can do some root pruning. So there's the opportunity to do some crop damage. And then in a number of organic systems, particularly vegetable systems, people use hand weeding and relying on that heavily can be expensive. So my colleague, Eric Gallant at the University of Maine did a um, analysis of many studies worldwide and looked at the control efficacy of a variety of inter and intra row cultivation tools and they average about 66% efficacy. That means a single pass of a particular tool on average would kill about two thirds of the weeds present, which means that about a third of them are still there. So multiple passes further reduce that number, but you get the idea that there's some survivors. Um, this is a slide from some colleagues in Denmark. And what you see here is uh, what they call a weeding sled where there are um, people lying on their bellies supported for ergometric reasons, but um, they're spending 80 to 200 hours per acre on carrots and onions to get the weeds out, and that's expensive. So what I'm gonna to argue today is that uh, effective weed management in organic systems requires attention to ecological processes and deploying them in multi-tactic strategies. That is, you're not just relying on one silver bullet or the perfect cultivator, you're putting together a whole variety of uh, stress and mortality factors on weeds that cumulatively move you towards where you want to be with regard to weed suppression. So the first thing I want to touch on is uh, what are called seed bank dynamics. And um, sometimes people think that ecology is a very, very uh, complicated subject and uses abstract concepts that don't really apply to real life. What I'm going to argue is that if you have balanced your checkbook or you have developed a pro forma for your business enterprises, you know more than enough to begin to manage weed seed banks. So here's a slide again from uh, Eric Gallon at the University of Maine, where soils have been drawn from three different farm fields, uh, two in Maine, one in Pennsylvania, and those soils were taken back into a glass house and watered and the weed seedlings were allowed to emerge. And you can see that the soil on the right from Trout Run, Pennsylvania has very few emergent weed seedlings, whereas the ones from the two farms in Maine have many more. And that's a reflection of the number of viable seeds in the soil seed bank. This work done in New Zealand uh, did a similar kind of soil sampling where they took soils from uh, cornfields, and then they uh, brought them back to the glass house and they allowed the seedlings to emerge. And then they looked at the relationship between the number of seeds that came up in the glass house and um, what actually came up in the cornfields where those soils were drawn. And you can see that there are linear relationships, both for lamps quarters and crabgrass about 
4% of the lamb's quarter seeds that are in the soil actually come up in the cornfield and about 8% of the large crabgrass seeds emerge as seedlings in the cornfield. But there is a relationship. So the more seeds you have in the soil seed bank, the greater the infestation you have in the crop growing in the field. All right, so uh, this idea of balancing your checkbook or building a business enterprise pro forma, basically you wanna know what's going in and what's going out of your stock of principle, or in this case, seeds in the soil. And seeds germinate and emerge as seedlings. So they leave the soil seed bank, but they can come back as new seed inputs. So if you have a lot of weeds going to seed, that yellow arrow indicates how many are coming back into the seed bank. And that indicates that more can come out as emergent seedlings. Some of those seeds in the soil um, will persist for many years. Uh, dormancy is a fact for many weed seeds uh, persisting for 10 or more years as possible. Seeds can be killed in the soil by infection by pathogens. They can uh, age out, they can senesce, they can get uh, into a situation where they fail to emerge because they're buried too deep or they didn't have the right germination cues and they die of old age. Or sometimes seeds that are buried deeply in the soil will germinate but fail to make it all the way as seedlings at the soil surface and they experience what's called fatal germination, whereas they pop but they never make it up to see sunlight. The final factor affecting what goes in and what goes out of the seed bank is what we call seed loss to predators. Predators can be insects, they can be birds, they could be mice, but um, weed seeds like crop seeds are little packets of calories and nutrients, and uh, they're valuable seed sources for many feeding organisms. And we'll talk more about that later. But when you look at the balance of uh, what comes in and what comes out of the soil seed bank, you can begin to see that if you're putting more in every year because you have poor weed control, you're loading up that seed bank and the possibilities for more seedlings emerging in your crop continue to go up. Whereas if you're minimizing seed inputs and you're maximizing seed death in the soil or seed loss to predators, the number of seedlings that emerge tends to be lower. So this basic idea of inputs and outputs and knowing what your principle is or your seed bank size is becomes an organizing idea for managing weeds and organic systems. All right, three seed related factors affecting weed management are the following. How seed burial depth affects seedling emergence what the survival rates are of seeds buried in the soil, and how different tillage implements distribute seeds in the soil profile. So let me show you how those pieces of the puzzle fit together. The seedlings of most weed species emerge only if the seeds are near the soil surface. So lamb's quarters and redroot pigweed have relatively small seeds if they're not within two centimeters or about an inch of the soil surface, their probability of emerging as seedlings is pretty low. Velvet leaf has a slightly larger seed with more stored reserves in the seeds. It can push from greater depths in the soil and it can emerge from depths up to about two and a half inches. Typically, it's emerging from depths of about an inch, but because it has a bigger seed, it can emerge from greater depths than can small seeded things like lamb's quarters, pigweed, and water hemp. But note that most things are emerging in the top one, maybe two inches of the soil surface. All right. <clears throat> what about seed survival? So here's the results of an experiment with 11 weed species. You can see them here. The English names are on the right side of the screen. They differ in size, big ones like giant ragweed and um, morning glory, and some small ones like uh, water hemp. 
They're buried in the soil at a depth of one inch in this experiment. And then for the next five years, the um, viability of those seeds in the soil is tracked. And what you see here are decay curves for those 11 species. And uh, velvet leaf, at the end of a five-year period, about 25% of the seeds are still viable in the soil. For giant ragweed, about 5% of the seeds are viable in the soil. For water hemp, maybe 20%. For um, Ceteria species, the uh, foxtails, you can see that they're dropping down to just a few percent, maybe one or two percent at the end of five years. So there's a lot of variability. Um, I mentioned before that dormancy and persistence in the soil allow many weed species to hang on for many years. But the important thing here is that after, say, three years, the size of the seed bank has dropped precipitously for almost all of the species. That's not to say all of them go away, but it means that you have many fewer seeds in the soil seed bank that are capable of emerging as seedlings than you did at the start. And that translates into a recommendation that you want to minimize seed inputs that if all possible. All right. The third piece of the puzzle that we need to know about is how different tillage implements affect seed distributions in the soil profile. And uh, a research group up at the um, ARS station in Morris, Minnesota, built a user-friendly program called Seed Chaser, where you can load in a whole variety of tillage implements in whatever sequence you want, and then put seeds on the soil surface and see how they're redistributed after multiple tillage events. They uh, did this work with beads in the soil, placed at different depths, and then they find the beads again, and they can estimate where things are moving from and where they're arriving. Okay, so if there were 10,000 seeds at the surface of a square meter of soil, here's how using a moldboard plow, a chisel plow, or a field cultivator would distribute them in the soil. You can see that a moldboard plow takes the seeds and buries them uh, down to a depth of 18 centimeters. Yeah, so that's uh, about nine inches, roughly. Um, in one pass, most of them are sunk with a moldboard plow below a depth from which they can successfully emerge as seedlings. With a chisel plow or a field cultivator, most of them remain close to the soil surface. Three centimeters is just over an inch deep. So if you're dealing with species like velvet leaf or giant ragweed, they can easily emerge from that depth. So using uh, surface tillage implements like a field cultivator or even a chisel plow tends to maintain seeds close to the soil surface where many of them have the capacity to generate seedlings that are gonna come up and infest your crop. If you kill those seedlings, you will have uh, reduced the soil seed bank, but if they're successful in living and can emerge, uh, if, if they're uh, successful in setting more seeds, then you have increased the size of the soil seed bank. What happens if you moldboard plow twice or multiple times? Moldboard plowing tends to distribute seeds evenly through the soil profile. So after you've gone through the first plowing, some of them come back up and you wind up with uh, a situation where many of the seeds are um, distributed evenly through the soil surface. All right, so the general recommendations are when many seeds are already distributed throughout the soil profile, use zero or minimum tillage practices and prevent the addition of more seeds, right? So the idea is if they're um, coming up, make sure they don't add more seeds to the soil seed bank. If you have a single year of poor weed control and they drop under the soil surface, but there are few seeds in the rest of the profile, the 
recent addition of seeds can be plowed deeply and then thereafter use minimum tillage techniques to keep that surface soil relatively free of weed seeds. All right, how do you prevent additions to the seed bank or so-called seed bank deposits? Well, one way is taking them out directly by hand roguing them. Um, I spent a number of years going back and forth to work at the Dutch Agricultural University. And uh, during my years there, I often visited large scale organic farms and uh, they were on very high value land. Land is at a premium in the Netherlands because it's a small country and they didn't waste any crop yield to weed competition. They would send in a crew and remove every single weed that they could see above the crop canopy in many crops. Um, some simple things like making sure that you overlap passes when you plant small grains so that you don't get skips where weeds can grow with exposure to full sunlight. So here you can see a barley field and uh, there's barnyard grass that was growing beneath that barley, but when the barley was planted poorly and there was a uh, say 10 inch skip between the passes of the planter, uh, there's no crop competition and a large amount of weed seed will be shed back onto the soil. So just good planting practices, rapid emergence, even stands and no skips is absolutely critical in organic farming. Um, Australian groups are working with what they call seed destructors, which are attached to the combine or are now within the combine itself to uh, grind up weed seeds in the crop chaff passing through the combine. There are some uh, companies in the Midwest that are experimenting with this. And there's a group at the University of Illinois that's beginning to look at whether weed seed harvesting and seed destruction can reduce the return of weed seeds um, from combine harvesters back onto the field. And it does appear, at least in Australia, where weed species of concern hold on to their seeds rather than dropping them before harvest. When they're picked up with the crop and they can be separated and then ground up and destroyed, you can uh, decrease the density of weed seeds in the soil and the return of weed seeds during crop harvesting operations. In uh, Iowa, we've done a lot of work on what we call seed predators. The two major ones we have are field crickets and mice. And um, mice are active throughout the winter and they will scurry around uh, looking for weed seeds as sources of calories and nutrients. Crickets tend to be active in the late summer and fall and are not active during the winter. We also have a number of ground beetles that eat weed seeds. So this is a ground beetle in the state of Maine consuming barnyard grass seeds. And you can see it's got an, the ability to uh, pierce the integument of the seed and uh, eat out the live parts on the inside. Uh, work done in Ohio found that 60% of the giant ragweed seeds placed on the soil surface were consumed between November and uh, the following spring. And if left on the soil surface for a full year, 88% of them were consumed. So this won't get rid of all your weed seeds. You're certainly not gonna solve all your problems with weed seed predators, but it can decrease the uh, density of weed seeds considerably. So if you wanna maximize the impact of these predators, delay tillage to keep seeds on the soil surface because buried seeds are hard for both insects and mice to find. And then providing crop canopy throughout the season so that seed predators can hide beneath um, the leaves and retain moisture is important. Insects dry out and uh, many weed seed predators like mice actually have animals that prey on them like hawks and uh, foxes. So where they can hide, um, they actually have a bigger impact on the weed seed bank. 
Strip cropping can help because weed seed predators are highly mobile and they can move from crops like forage crops or a mid-season canopy of soybean and corn to other crops like uh, the stubble of small grains that are harvested in the middle of the summer. So they can move back and forth between canopy areas and areas without canopy and uh, consume weed seeds. All right, another aspect of biology and ecology we need to pay attention to is the timing of emergence of weed species. And there are large differences among species here in work done by um, Bob Hartzler in Iowa, you can see the uh, timing of giant foxtail and water hemp seedling emergence. And water hemp is a warmer season weed, shall we say, than giant foxtail. It tends to come up a bit later and um, foxtail comes up earlier. When we wanna compare species with regard to their emergence timing, we think about the initial date when they start to come up, how long that burst of emergence occurs, and what the distribution pattern looks like. And it'll be affected by rainfall patterns and soil temperatures, but they're broad groupings of species. We can say that, for instance, um, giant ragweed and lamb's quarters tend to be species that emerge earlier in the season than things like water hemp. All right, when we begin to think about how that information could be used, rotations move into the forefront. So rotating spring, summer, and fall planted crops favors different suites of weed species based on their emergence, seedling emergence patterns. And a good rotation will prevent the buildup of any one weed species. Fall germinating species typically are suppressed by spring tillage prior to planting crops like corn and soybean. Spring germinating species are suppressed by summer tillage. So if you had something that came up and grew in the understory of a um, oat crop, you could go at it in the stubble of the oat crop. And spring germinating species are suppressed by competition from overwintering crops. So if you're having a big problem with uh, things that germinate in the spring, uh, winter cereals would be an important consideration for adding to your crop rotation. A uh, analysis done by two of my former students found that uh, relative to simple rotations or monocultures, Diverse rotations have on average 49% lower density of weeds than um, the monocultures or simple rotations. And when we looked at the factors that were most important in reducing weed density within a target crop, it's the variation in crop planting dates that's most important. It's not the number of species in the crop rotation, it's the variation in the dates in which you put those crops into the ground. So having fall planted cereals with spring planted crops like corn and soybean can be advantageous. If you have a three year stand of alfalfa where you're only planting once every uh, three or more years, um, that gives you a huge period of time when there's no soil disturbance and uh, the cues for weed emergence can be dramatically reduced. So diverse rotations with species that have very different planting dates is important when you plan your rotation with regard to weed control. All right, how might crop rotation be used to control giant ragweed? This is one of our friends in Iowa and certainly across the uh, central corn belt, it's been moving west. Initially, it was found in abundance in uh, Ohio and Indiana, and it's now all through Illinois, well into Iowa, and it's moving westward. And it's called giant ragweed for a good reason. It can overtop many crops 
including corn. And uh, once it sees daylight, once it's moved through the crop canopy, it has the ability to put on huge amounts of growth and um, be highly competitive with the associated crops. Um, it has the ability to push through spring planted crops even when they're early planted. So here you see a field of barley in uh, northeast Iowa, organic barley, and the giant ragweed has pushed through it. It has the ability to elongate the internodes between its leaves so that if it's under shade, it starts to extend itself in a way that allows it to quickly overtop the associated crops. And once it's over the top of your crop, you really have very few options other than uh, mowing off the crop if you're in an organic system. So adding forage and winter cereal crops to a corn soybean rotation can shift the crop weed balance. And let's take a look at how that works for giant ragweed. So with multiple forage harvests, you can interfere with seed production. And as we heard this morning, giant ragweed have seeds that typically don't last that long in the soil. Um, a certain percentage of them will persist, but you can drop that number of uh, viable seeds in the soil seed bank fairly dramatically within a period of about three years. So multiple harvests of forage crops is a very important way to um, prevent any germinating giant ragweeds from setting seed. Then you have winter cereal crops like uh, this situation here where you can direct drill into soybean stubble. You get a uh, dense stand. In this case, um, we're looking at uh, crops like winter triticale, winter rye, hybrid rye, winter wheat. And uh, in central Iowa, with a densely planted stand by the third week of April, you have almost complete soil coverage that can be highly competitive against giant ragweed. And um, by the early summer, you're getting ready to harvest. And again, giant ragweed typically sets seed at the end of the summer. So a midsummer harvest gives you the ability to take off a crop and damage the giant ragweed that might be in the understory before it sets seed. So here you're looking at uh, Tom Franson in north central Iowa, who's growing hybrid winter rye. And uh, the field in which he grew that rye had a dense infestation of giant ragweed, but the ragweed was not able to compete successfully with the winter rye because it had a head start. It had been planted in the fall. It got growing immediately when things warmed up in the spring and the giant ragweed was shaded and droughted by the associated cereal crop. So. Uh, winter cereals can be an important component of a giant ragweed management plan. So uh, modeling analyses can indicate uh, how different rotations would affect giant ragweed population dynamics. And um, what you see here is the results of a model that basically works just like building a business pro forma looking at what goes in and what goes out. And I compared different crop sequences, the two-year corn soybean sequence with um, corn soybean augmented with rye and alfalfa with the alfalfa stand maintained for different numbers of years. And what you see here is that the uh, level of control effectiveness, efficacy in corn and soybean that's required to keep giant ragweed in check uh, drops fairly dramatically as you move towards a longer rotation from a simple corn soybean rotation. Um, it drops fairly dramatically from a three-year rotation where you need close to 98% control efficacy in corn and soybean down to about 84% control efficacy in corn and soybean when you have multiple years of um, alfalfa following a year of rye. So <clears throat> putting together rotations that stress giant ragweed with crops planted at different times and harvested at different times can be a way to interfere with the seed production and seed deposition of giant ragweed and then bleed out that soil seed bank 
And over time, you can reduce the level of control efficacy that's required in row crops like corn and soybean and still maintain reasonable control of giant ragweed. All right, one thing Margaret Smith asked me to address is whether hand weeding makes sense. So suppose you have a giant ragweed problem in a winter cereal plus red clover intercrop corn soybean rotation. So a, a three year rotation. And let's assume that during the corn and soybean phases of the rotation, you can achieve 95% control of giant ragweed by cultivating. Would it make sense to hand weed the giant ragweed plants that survive in corn and soybean. So <clears throat> I built a model with data that I brought out of the literature that's been published in scientific journals. And um, that information includes seed germination rates in different crops, seedling emergence rates in different crops, seedling survival rates when subjected to different control strategies like cultivation or herbicides. And then I put in different levels of hand weeding or mowing efficacy. And I included in the model seed production by adults in different crops, and then seed death rates due to predation and decay. And I started out with a seed bank density of 100 giant ragweed seeds per meter squared. And when you build a model like that, it looks a little complicated right? Because you have a bunch of life history stages, seeds in soil, small seedlings, large seedlings, mature plants. You have processes like seed production and seed death. And you have different crops in the rotation. And each of those have different seed death rates and different seed production rates and different seed predation rates. But with computers, we can basically take giant spreadsheet calculations and put them into dynamic population dynamics models that are really, again, nothing more than what you would do if you built a business pro forma where you had several enterprises and you want to know what your cash situation is going to be. All right, so uh, here's the impact of hand weeding corn and soybean on giant ragweed density. Um, the two columns on the right side show the number of adult plants per acre over a nine year period with 95% cultivation efficacy with zero hand weeding in the column on the left side and 90% hand weeding on the right side. That means when you send a hand weeding crew in, they tear out and kill 90% of the giant ragweed plants that survive cultivation. And you can see that um, it's quite effective, right? It's uh, dropping in years eight and nine populations that would otherwise be up to 240,000 down to four plants. So it looks pretty good. And the question is, you know, how long does it take hand weeders to grow a field and do that? And how much are you gonna to have to pay them on a per hour basis? So I made some assumptions for hand weeding. I said, okay, an acre with 30 inch rows requires walking 17,424 linear feet. Let's say your walking speed is two miles an hour. And therefore <clears throat> you can walk 1.65 Uh, it takes you 1.65 hours to walk an acre. If it takes you 30 seconds to pull or hoe out each weed, it takes you about eight thousandth of an hour to kill each weed. And that translates into uh, the following numbers of hand weeding hours per acre. Um, if you... Um, Look at the number of large seedlings that are there on the side with zero hand weeding. And 90% uh, hand weeding on the right side of 
you can see that um, it drops a lot, right? Your your um, this this I'm sorry. This should be 90% hand weeding. Excuse me. Um, this is dropping down considerably. And uh, the number of hours that you're spending on hand weeding drops down to about uh, 1.8 or 1.7 in years eight and nine. If you can pair hand weeding with 95% cultivation efficacy. So if you're spending 15 or more dollars an hour, initially you're you know, you're going to be spending hundreds of dollars an acre, but after five or six years, if you've maintained good hand weeding control uh, coupled with uh, good cultivation efficacy, you can drop to a fairly low level. And your numbers of adult plants have dropped considerably, and uh, that's going down every year. Again, this slide should say 95% cultivation efficacy and 90% hand weeding for large seedlings per acre. Okay, I want to talk briefly about the management of perennial weeds. The key is exhaustion of below ground reserves. And um, it, you can think of sort of the th th three leaf rule or the six to 12 inch rule whenever the weeds get more than three leaves or more than uh, six to 12 inches high, they um, start to accumulate photosynthate carbohydrates in their underground reserves. So shallow roots and rhizomes, you want to chop and bury or drag and desiccate them. Deep roots and rhizomes, you want to hit them low and often. And using competitive crops that are frequently cultivated or short season crops gives you the ability to physically attack the um, underground portions of perennial weeds. So uh, with quackgrass, the three or four leaf stage um, is where uh, the plant grows from expending carbohydrates to begin to accumulate carbohydrates. So uh, when it pushes up a shoot in the spring and begins to photosynthesize, it's using up the underground reserves to get that shoot up to the soil surface. But once it starts photosynthesizing, it uh, begins to fill up the underground reserves once again. So if you were to continually till it, um, it doesn't have the chance to regenerate those underground carbohydrate reserves and you can deplete the uh, subsurface reserves and begin to get a handle on long-term control of perennials. Canada thistle, in uh, my experience, is a big problem in organic production, particularly here in the upper Midwest. And Canada thistle regenerates not only from seeds, but also from deep growing roots and rhizomes. These can be very deep and hard to access. Um, Long-term survival of Canada thistle depends again on carbohydrate supply to its roots and rhizomes. And uh, typically, the carbohydrates in the roots and rhizomes look like this. When it initiates new shoots, it uses up some of those reserves. At about the time it's initiating flower buds, it's now got enough photosynthetic activity that it can um, begin to accumulate more underground reserves. And um, when it begins to set rosettes again in the fall, it decreases a little bit. But uh, if you really haven't interfered with the accumulation of underground reserves at the end of the season, it's got even more than what it started out with and you're in trouble. So this is what happens under good growing conditions where you don't have a lot of competition or you haven't depleted reserves by tillage events that um, break up the underground parts and, and interfere with shoot growth before too much carbohydrate is accumulated below ground. If you get into a situation where you can reduce the amount of sunlight getting to the shoots and you can interfere with the recharge of the underground portions, you can wind up with lower reserves at the end of the season than what you started the season with. 
So growth in Canada thistle is reduced when the light intensity is below 60 or 70 percent of full daylight and shoots and seedlings typically die when light intensity falls below 20 percent of full daylight. And this can happen below a well-developed crop canopy and particularly if you're using things like uh, warm season cover crops like sorghum sedan grass and Japanese millet, you can have a uh, fairly dramatic impact on the amount of light getting through to the shoots of Canada thistle. Coupling high competition from crops, including summer cover crops with tillage can have a uh, fairly strong suppressive effect on Canada thistle, but it takes time. Here's uh, an experiment that was done in Denmark where they looked at um, combining mowing with grass and clover growing in the under in the uh, stubble of a barley crop. And you can see that uh, mowing reduced the biomass of Canada thistle growing in the next year's cereal crop, but uh, coupling mowing with competition from grass and clover growing in the stubble of the barley crop was more effective. So it can take a lot of mowing or it can take considerable number of cultivations, but crop competition itself is an important factor to uh, load into your repertoire of tactics to use against Canada thistle. Okay, long-term success in managing weeds and organic systems requires multiple tactics. It requires reducing the soil seed bank. It requires depleting the energy reserves and underground plant parts. But uh, as you can see in this slide from the Netherlands, um, it can be done on a fairly large scale. This field had not had very much hand weeding, maybe uh, one quick hand weeding to remove any weeds that had grown above the crop canopy. It was not intensively cultivated, but it was in a long rotation with crops of very different growth habits and different planting dates. It included forage crops within the rotation, and the seed bank had been effectively managed over multiple years. So with that, um, I'll take any questions you might have, and uh, we'll take a look at uh, what all right, thank you, Matt. Um, qu first question here, do you know of any data qua quantifying reductions in weed seed production with weed zapping? Be interesting to compare that with the impact of hand weeding. No, I, I haven't seen data on seed production through weed zapping. It's gonna depend on the point you're at in the weed life cycle. So for instance, you can pull weeds out of the field with seeds that are not completely mature. And those seeds will continue to ripen. If they're outside on the border of the field, that's not a problem. But if you leave them in the field after you've pulled them, those seeds that mature on the cut, but still maturing plant can add to the soil seed bank. So if you weed zap late, maybe those seeds continue to mature. I don't know, but it would be uh, important to attack the weed prior to the time when the seeds are close to maturity and could continue to ripen on the plant. All right, thank you. Another question here, um, any suggestions on controlling gypsum weed? Um, I have, seen jimson weed growing but i have never dealt with it i would assume that it's um, a large seeded species it's a datura um, i don't know the longevity of datura seeds it would have the capacity to emerge with a large seed from greater depths in the soil than things like water hemp but I'd have to know more about the uh, seed longevity before I could give you a 
recommendation for what kind of rotation or what kind of uh, plans you might develop for controlling jimson weed. Field bindweed um, is akin to um, Canada thistle in terms of its ability to store considerable amounts of carbohydrates below ground at great depth. And um, a farmer in eastern Nebraska that I knew would isolate an organic farmer um, would isolate areas of his field where he had dense bindweed infestations and he would go at it with um, repeated tillage events throughout the summer. He would allow the bindweed to express itself until it was maybe six or eight inches tall, and then he would uh, attack it with cultivation. And um, maybe you could pair that with um, some dense cover cropping. But again, it will take a significant amount of time to deplete the underground reserves of field bindweed because it's deep in the soil and uh, you have to allow it to grow to express some shoot growth but you have to kill it above ground before those shoots start putting more carbohydrates for storage below ground so it's a a delicate balancing act between getting the expression of shoots and killing them before you're loading up that below ground carbohydrate bank. Yeah, yeah sounds like a quite the conundrum there and tricky process to control it. Um, are there any biological products that are effective? Um, there are some products that have been commercialized, but um, in some cases, they've been so effective, they put themselves out of business. Um, there was a, a weed that was common in citrus orchards in uh, the south, and a specific fungus was developed, but it was so effective that <clears throat> the weed no, was no longer a problem. There have been several commercialized. Many have not um, persisted in the marketplace. They're considered sort of niche. and um, the thing about herbicides is they have broad efficacy, right? They work on many species. And the thing about biocontrols is you don't want them to work on a lot of species, right? Because if they can <clears throat> kill a lot of species, you don't have necessarily a lot of crop safety. So they have to be very specific. And when they're very specific, companies are oftentimes re reluctant to try to market them. Right, because they won't have a big draw in the marketplace. Hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah, no, that's uh, another thing you have to think about too is companies putting together and trying to make sure it's prof profitable for them and everything as well. So you don't think of that too much. So, all right, well, thank you very much there, Matt. It was, we enjoyed having you, having you present. Um, Wait, one more question. Uh, bar cucumber, before I let you go, sorry, just one quick thing here. Bar cucumber is becoming more prevalent in Northwest Iowa, maybe more I spread. Why the spread and what to do? Well, if I recall, bar cucumber has a fairly large seed and, um, you know, maybe it's one of those species that's becoming better adapted to the tillage regimes that people are using. I'm not sure. Um, as seasons are getting warmer, it's hard to believe that today, but in general, our weather, particularly our nighttime temperatures are going up in the other Midwest. Maybe we're seeing some species range shifts. Um, yeah, I can't speak to exactly why it's becoming more common. Generally, I look at shifts in tillage and shifts in crop planting dates and in some cases the mix of crops that are being grown in rotations as explanatory factors for why particular weeds are becoming more or less prevalent all right and then there's one more that gets snuck in here as well um, any major correlation between seed nutrient levels and a particular weed for example people i've heard that Many 
that gypsum reduces fox sale. Have you heard anything about that and any correlation? Yeah, I think there's always been quite a bit of discussion about how uh, calcium and magnesium might affect weeds. My general impression about nutrient levels and weeds is that you should shoot for soil fertility conditions that are maximally advantageous to your crop. And uh, when the crop does well and its canopy develops rapidly, you have the greatest ability to suppress weeds. Um, crop competition and cultivation are the two major factors in organic systems that are uh, impacting weeds. And I think that, um, you know, generally weeds are adapted to the same growing conditions that crops are. So um, I think it's difficult to fine tune fertility regimes in such a way that you can differentially benefit the crop and suppress the weed. I think uh, weeds and crops are close enough that you should just concentrate on making sure that the growing environment for your crop is as good as you can make it. That is a vinyl collection behind me. Yeah, that was those good. It's not. It's uh, quite impressive. Uh, like Cole said there. <laughs> what are you listening to lately? Kind of ending on something. Kind of. What am I listening to lately? I, I have a very uh, wide range of musical tastes, ranging from jazz to classical to rock and blues. Uh, 